So I'm a little bit geeky. I like uh, watching UFO documentaries on Friday nights when everyone else is socialising, and I like watching documentaries about the unknown in general. I'm um, like. I understand that most things that are seen probably have a rational explanation, but I enjoy watching these programs because I like the thrill of the possibility. You know, there's a small chance. I like to give them an opportunity to get me excited and persuade me, maybe. But most documentaries that, if not all documentaries that I've been watching um, about the topic of UFOs tend to be films that try to convince us that there's alien life living amongst us and eccentric Americans with strange haircuts and dramatic lighting. Or the sort of reality TV programs which try to make fun of the, the subjects, basically the whole thing set up so we can all laugh at them and think that they're weird. And I've just always felt that between the speculation or the humiliation that there's another way to tell the story. Uh, here to your left, you have Klaus Vaughn. That's our main character in the documentary. Um, when Klaus Vaughn was 14, he convinced his father to drive him and his friends around to investigate UFO cases in the little town Mariestad. What Klaus didn't know at the time was that this was the start of a long life love affair with the unknown. Uh, Klaus, he's now the head of you for Sweden, and he's also a well-respected journalist at Sweden's at Dagens Nyheter in Stockholm. And Klaus has spent the last 20 years working extremely hard trying to remove the stigma associated with UFO investigation. And uh, every day, someone in Sweden calls you for Sweden because they've seen something that they can't explain. And Klaus and his team, they go out and they investigate and they are very proud of the fact that they are able to find a natural explanation to almost all of the cases that they investigate. Um, but for decades there's been a thorn in their side. There's been one case that they have never been able to solve, the ghost rockets. It's um, <coughs> Spurk, Spurk rocket in, in Swedish. Um, it's one of the coolest mysteries I ever read about. I discovered it on uh, Wikipedia and I thought everybody in Sweden must know about this already. So I asked around <coughs> some of my normal group of friends and no one had heard of it. And so then I started asking some more geeky friends to, at science fiction bookstore etc. And they hadn't heard of it. And I realised that actually many people hadn't heard of this and I thought, great, this is going to be a really interesting story to tell. So basically, I'll summarise it for you. This is the only photo of a ghost rocket, but it turned out to be a meteor. <coughs> uh, class fun, work that one out. But what happens is since 1946, uh, thousands of people across Sweden have been seeing these strange objects manoeuvring, uh, landing and crashing into lakes. What makes, them, uh, what makes it a ghost rocket? It tends to be quite small. Uh, tends to manoeuvre, which, uh, which is something that they shouldn't have been able to do back in 1946, apparently. And uh, they sink down into the water. So in response, the Swedish military are like, OK, we've got to find out what this is. So they set up a special committee, and they called it the Ghost Rockets Investigation Committee, because you guys are very practical with your namings. And uh, they had a clear objective to find out what they are and see if you can find out where they came from. So they set out and they went out to all the lakes across Sweden and they sampled the ground trying to find any sort of metallic fragment or anything. The only thing they could find was these craters and like plants that had been torn off from the bottom of the lake. So they, they were very convinced that something had been there, they just never could ever work out what it was. Um, <clears throat> but what I'll do is I'll, I'll just play a trailer for you so you can... Take a look at the type of film that we're going to put together. It's three and a half minutes long. Ja, tack så mycket för spår. Hon sköts med ett nära sällne. Och det är två personer som såg ett civilflygplan som passerar väster ut i den här tiden. Men framför det, och lite ovanför, så är det ett trekantigt föremål. 
Möller som ska färdas med flygplanen. Jag lyssnar på allting, jag undersöker allting. Jag söker svaren, och alla svar är bra svar. Det är tusentals olika fenomen och rapporter som som jag har stött på sedan tidigt 70-tal och undersökt och vänt och vridit på och oftast kunnat hitta förklaringarna på oss. Men det finns ju ett fenomen som har hängt med liksom hela tiden och det är spökraketerna. Det är inte därför 1946 och det året såg man över tusen små raketer i Sverige. Stort intresse utomlands. Folk frågar ofta vad var det egentligen? Vad var det folk såg? Det pappret har ju legat där i utvis i många, många årtionden. Ja, det var hemligt. Men det är jag hemligen. För det var ju spökrakhetskommittén då som jobbade med att hitta förklaringen. Och de hittade aldrig någon förklaring. Nej, den gjorde inte det. Och det här var ju då, kan man säga, början på en våg av rapporter som sedan har pågått än in i våran tid. Och i den här Höga av rapporter så finns då det som Bo och Liss observerade. Nu hörde vi det här ljudet ovanför oss som, som det låter när ett flygplan kommer åka ner utan att gasa. Det var ett helt väsande ljud. Vi tänkte på det som en, en kryssningsmissil som hade kommit fel från zombie. Alltså så tänkte vi. Men sen var det ju att den bromsade ju in och vände. Och sen landade i sjön och sjönk. Och det var ju fullt, det var ju fullt med fåglar på så att det liksom flög upp en massa fåglar. Och sen såg man ju att det var ju... Det kraschade ju inte utan det landade och sjönk. Vilket då gör att det kan ligga kvar intakt där. Ja ah, okej, okay. vad innebär 270? Är det en längd eller? Ja, det är längd. Mm. Jag tror man tänkt sig lite grann på att gå om man fiskar i fjällen och sånt där. Ja, det passar ju perfekt. Ja, det är typ det vi ska göra. Det finns fler problem, ja. men det är två saker som går. Det ena är att transporta en utrustning så att få en grejerna på plats. Det andra är att vi inte har någon lyckare. Så det här är ju <laughs> kanske en pusselbit till lösningen av den största UFO-båten i världen som jag ser. Spökraket vågen 46 är som hände efter. Bara ensam i den värsta den inträffande människan. För en mänsklighet att stå ensam kan vara minst lika hemskt. Jag tror att det är en sak. Och att veta är en helt annan sak. Sweden have just come back now from this investigation that you've sort of been preparing for. Um, like any worthy UFO investigation, they used a helicopter to fly in over a ton of equipment to a lake in uh, Namiyarak. You know, outside of Jokmok. Outside of Jokmok. Um, it took them a long time to plan it. Uh, there was a lot of logistical issues they had to overcome. Class is quite convinced that no one anywhere else in the world has ever done an investigation on this scale privately uh, funded. Um, but you can never be sure about these things. <clears throat> they spent a couple of days out in the um, out in the forest. There's about 15 people in total. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they camped there for a couple of days and they uh, scanned the lake bed with a side scan sonar looking for anything on the bottom of the lake to see if there was anything worth diving down for. They sent out two divers uh, who then went down to investigate anything that they saw interesting. What they found again, like in the original investigation, was uh, a crater. It's pretty much exactly where they thought it, they had seen it land. Um, but the lake bed was extremely muddy and this, the, the metal detector that I had with them wasn't good enough to scan through such a depth. So now they're preparing for a return journey when the lake defrosts again. So we have to go back out there and film them once again. But um, even though the um, investigation committee of 1946 failed to find an answer to the mystery, 
Um, there was a lot of speculation thrown out. Some people within the military also said that we can't exclude extraterrestrial possibilities, but back then they said those sort of things quite a lot. Um, even though they failed to find an answer, they did leave behind um, thousands and thousands of pages of reports, which they collected uh, and maintained very well. Um, the reports have all the information from their investigation, plus a collection of all of the reports that came from across Sweden. And we knew that these reports were pretty interesting, and so we went up to Riksarkivet, which is where they're stored, and we spoke to them, and we said, can we get them? Because they're declassified now. <clears throat> can you show this next slide? Um, they're still in the process of crossing off this, uh, which apparently they have to do before we can scan them. But what we've done is we've got permission to scan in, I guess it's around two to 3,000 pages, and put them online. And so we're thinking, okay, probably someone's going to be interested in seeing this. So we started looking around. <clears throat> and uh, I remembered back in 2008, the BBC... Uh, the Ministry of Defence uh, released their documents. Uh, it was the first time uh, a government had released the UFO documents. And the response was so huge that uh, from around the world, everyone wanted to see what was going on, that it literally crashed the servers because everybody was just um, so eager to find out what was going on with these Ministry of Defence files. Uh, so we know that people want to see what it is the government's doing with this information, you know, how was their perspective on, on this subject. Uh, but part of the reason I think that the Ministry of Defence uh, files are so popular is because they were in, well, because they were in English, because so many people could access them. It was kind of a slightly more <coughs> universal language than Swedish. Uh, <coughs> um, so we started thinking, well, maybe we should translate them. We've got the technology. We took a look at the text, and most of the reports had been typed. Uh, the pages have been kept in archive quality, and they're all in very good condition, so we should be able to OCR, optical character recognition, use Google Translate, translate them, get people to clean up the translation, because it's pretty messy if you've ever tried it. Um, and then people from all over the world can finally see what the Swedish government's doing. Then we ran into a little thing which was done also in the UK by uh, a newspaper called the Guardian newspaper. And what they did is they had access to a couple hundred thousand pages of um, Parliament expense receipts. And they were quite convinced that there was something fraudulent going on in the receipts. People were spending money where they shouldn't have been. But the amount of receipts they had was huge. And they wanted to have an exclusive. They wanted to be the first people that could show that there was something dodgy going on with these receipts. And they didn't have enough time to go through them. So they thought, let's let our readers help us. So they put them up online and they said, go through these and mark, just press a button if you see something suspicious. Uh, you know, some sort of suspicious transaction. <laughs> and uh, they had 32,000 people go through over 225,000 pages uh, within a few weeks, and they were the first people to break the story. So here we've got an example of people want to see UFO documents, mm -hmm. and we've got a good example of crowdsourcing, which is what it's called. Uh, so we started to think to ourselves, there's a connection, <laughs> we should probably do something with this. So at the moment we're in a, a stage where we're in developing a um, crowdsourced UFO investigation tool. So in these documents, may lay an answer to the ghost rockets. Um, the clues that you can put together from a large amount of documents uh, with crowdsourcing can give you something that back in 1946 they didn't really have the ability to do because they were still working with paper. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to build a, a simple interface that's going to let 
uh, users enter in data that they see on the pieces of paper. So what was the date? What direction was the object flying? Did it crash? Did it land? Did it have wings? Did it make a sound? How many people saw it? Um, all this sort of uh, information that you were first reading think that would be useful for us to use. And through that, uh, what we're effectively doing is that we're putting our audience into the same shoes as our protagonist, as our story, uh, people that we're following. So we're asking our audience, this is the story of your first Sweden investigating it. Can you help us? You can do it too. So we can all become UFO investigators. <laughs> Um, so what we're doing is we're making uh, one documentary and we're also building this investigation tool. And then the question is why do we spend time and energy in building something on the web when we're documentary filmmakers? And there is actually a reason for that. Um, the documentary industry is in a huge crisis. It's just like the music industry. It, the whole distribution system has completely crashed and failed and it's really 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 hard to make any money back from uh, your product what you're creating um, so we felt that everyone in the documentary industry is running around being really scared what's going on how are we going to make money in the future and me and michael felt that it's we can't just sit here and be scared we can't be threatened by this new shift we have to do something and how can we explore and experiment and see this as an opportunity instead. And already from the beginning we knew that there must be lots of people out there in the world that would be interested in a documentary about Swedish UFO investigators. It sounds really cool. <laughs> um, and we, we just didn't know how do we reach all of these people. Internet is there, yes, but how do we find these people? How do they find out about us? Um, we felt that our main audience is very much like Michael. We think that they're geeky and they're online. <laughs> so we were thinking that's, that's where we will put our energy, that's where we will find them. And to start exploring how to find them and how to get them to us, uh, we got interested in new work methods called cross-media and transmedia. And I will shortly describe the difference to you. This is an example of a cross-media workflow. You can imagine in the middle, for example, you have a film, this is a product. For example, it's Lord of the Rings. Um, what's very typical for uh, cross-media is that it's mostly been Hollywood, big productions that can afford to do this. You have a product and then you have the same story and the same characters, but they are on many different platforms. So you make a mobile game app, you do video, maybe you do a photo exhibition, maybe you do a website with extra material. But what's the same for everyone is that it's the same character and it's the same story on every platform. So the Lord of the Rings is the same character, he lives in the same house, he has the same friends, etc. But when it comes to transmedia, it's very different and becomes very complicated quickly. Here we're talking about different content on different platforms, but they're all part of the same universe. It's many parts to a story, the core is the same, but it could be different message and different tone in each part of the transmedia experience. The transmedia experience, this beauty of it is that you can choose to only take part of one part of the whole experience and you may have very fun and like this here, but if you take part of more parts of the experience, your experience will be greater and deeper and you will have a deeper understanding of what's going on and you will also have more fun. Um, for us, the ghost rockets, for example, if you take the, the phenom phenomena ghost rockets, we are telling the story in the film through UFO Sweden and through Klaus Vaughn and their investigation. But then we also have a Facebook site where we are now, since a year back, constantly telling the story about investigation and the ghost rockets mystery. And then we also have the document app that Michael told you about just now, which tells a slightly different part of the story. You can go deeper into it if you want to, but you can also choose to only see the film or maybe only spend time in the document app. Um, this new technology has opened up the opportunities for us as independent filmmakers to explore 
methods and different platforms in a way that was not possible for us about even five years ago. And uh, it's brought about a very big change within the industry and it's become quite popular to try these different platforms. And no one really knows what will come out of it yet. It's still hard to make money off it. Um, but I think we're part of something interesting and something new which makes it inspiring and well worth it anyway, at least for a while. <laughs> Um, I'd like to give you another example. This is from our website. This is an image of Carl Gösta Bartol. He's from the Swedish military and this is from 1946 when they were out investigating a ghost rocket that had crashed in a lake called Sjölmjörn. This image is quite famous and it's if you go to ghost rockets on Wikipedia this is the first thing you will see. But we got hold of an interview with this man that Klaus Mann did in the 80s. It's a one hour long interview and uh, we will, of course, maybe later put it up on our website in the whole interview so anyone can look at it as well. But we started thinking, what else can we do with this material that we have? So we created a short teaser which we will release a bit later uh, in our production, which will be more uh, it's a teaser to drag people into a project in a different way, and I'd like to show you the teaser. Should we also try to make it easier for the civil population on some level? Det sa sig inte, men det ansåg jag var självklart att man skulle göra. Men vi kunde inte hitta ett enda metallfragment. Var inte det väldigt förbrukande? Jo, vi förstod inte hur det kunde undgå att finnas. Det var aldrig någon tvekan med det. by the way, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> you could, I, I negotiated that one. Um, but uh, it's an example of... Um, the documentary that we're making is what's called a character-led documentary, or creative documentary. It's a, it's a genre within the documentary genre. And what it means is, generally speaking, we don't have sit-down interviews. It's not much about... It's not uh, a story that is designed to give you information or facts. Uh, it's an in-the-moment story, so you don't usually refer to the past. Uh, what we do is we, we follow our subjects doing what they normally do every day. So we, if you're for Sweden and doing an expedition, we go to the expedition, we film them holding the expedition, and we put it together, and eventually the drama and the narrative fall into place. It's a little bit more structured than that, but that's the general idea. But one disadvantage of it is that um, you do lose the ability to tell a very detailed factual story. For example, like the ghost rockets. And I just thought it was uh, too cool a story to, to not to do in this way. Um, so one of the things I really liked about the opportunities of this transmedia storytelling is that we can do both. We can tell both stories. We can tell the factual story and we can show the personal story as well. And I think that that's, uh, for me, it's, it's a relief. We don't have to give up something. If we did a factual based uh, documentary where class fans sat down and talked about the ghost rockets for 45 minutes and showed photos, 
we would have lost something which I thought was very important as the motivation why they spend so much time doing this and showing the personal elements, which is more universal, everyone can relate to. But um, eventually we found ourselves in a situation where we were doing things for this film that we didn't know anything about uh, and we didn't expect to be doing as filmmakers in general. So we're now running a Facebook page, we're developing an application, we're um, doing online marketing, we're doing targeted marketing, uh, we're doing market research, we're doing all sorts of things that we don't, would never have guessed that we'd be doing a year and a half ago. And it's been a learning curve and we have to wear many hats. And this is one of the things that people are talking about a lot in this industry. It's like, how can I be expected to do all of these things? And when you go to a PR marketing or social media company and say, I've got a documentary, can you help me out? The first thing is they ask you if you're talking about Swedish crowns in the budget or if it's euros, because they're confused about the amounts that we normally work in. So it doesn't work. So you end up having to do a lot of things yourself. Um, so in general, what we've done is we've just gone with our gut. What does our gut tell us we should be doing right now? So we, first and foremost, we tried to find where does our audience communicate and how do they communicate? So we spent a few weeks uh, scouring through Facebook, finding all of the paranormal blog, uh, pages, all of the UFO pages, all of the conspiracy pages, all of these things. There's a whole world in there that I knew existed and didn't really want to be part of, but yeah, we're right in there now. <laughs> um, and then we went through and we looked at um, blogs, more underground blogs, uh, popular UFO conspiracy pages, things like that. And we started looking how are these people communicating with each other, which ones are the active pages. Uh, and so <clears throat> we summarized it all up. We looked at the amount of communication that was happening on each platform and we summarized, okay, so let's target these top three because we can't be everywhere because it takes a ridiculous amount of time. <clears throat> So that's why we, in part, we decided to work with um, Facebook. Um, because A, it's a really good communication tool. It's already there. We don't have to reinvent it. So our, web, our website basically is, like it's, we call it like a magazine style. There's no way to communicate on our website. There's no uh, any way to enter information or do anything. It's not interactive. We're using Facebook specifically for that, which is why there's a big thing right on the front page that lets you realize that's where the communication is happening. Um, so what we found is we're doing a lot of things that we just basically um, had no idea um, what we're doing. <laughs> um, but over time it became easier and we just started um, just testing things, just doing things, and just seeing how it happened. But one thing that we did notice was very important is that each um, media has a very different form of communication. And Kirsten can tell you a little bit about what we learned about that. Yeah, we've been uh, working with Facebook actively now for one and a half a year, I think. And what we've learned over time is the importance of being personal. Um, <clears throat> We, on our Facebook group, we tell the story of UFO Sweden about, we talk about the ghost rockets phenomena, and we talk about the investigation into the ghost rockets phenomena, and we also post about our work with the documentary, how is it proceeding, what's happening. And in all of these posts, we're trying to be as personal as possible, and the reason for that is that we want people to connect with us, with the story. And we want them to care about if you first Sweden find something in the lake. And we want them to care about how it's going with our documentary. Because we think that then in the end they will also buy the documentary. Um, when we got back from the expedition that Michael told you about, the first thing that we saw on the front page of a magazine was this. 
and this is Michael and that is me. Uh, out on the expedition there was a lot of uh, journalists hanging around and writing about the expedition. And we thought it was quite uh, fun, this image, so we took a photo, we put it up in our Facebook group with the title, the first thing that we saw when we came back into civilization is Michael's butt crack. <laughs> and that's the uh, level of how personal we are at the moment. And it took us a year to get to this personal level. We've been experimenting, and I think a year ago we would not have been this personal with our audience. But now we realize that they actually like it. <laughs> um, it wasn't the only one actually. I think the journalists were having a bit of fun with me because if you opened it up, there's a two spread, uh, page spread of my butt crack in every shot. <laughs> but um, the other thing that we um, that we noticed was was really important was um, being honest with our audience. We did a little bit of research on similar uh, blogs, similar types of events, and we watched the events un, um, unfold. And we noticed that when uh, you start a page like this, when you start a Facebook page, and you allude to information coming, you need to come through with your promise. Uh, so we decided very early on, um, information will be free. So if you want to find out what's going on with the investigation, you can do so. Um, but if you want an experience like a documentary, then that's something that we feel we should be able to ask for you to contribute for. Um, what we ended up finding is that we'll, we're interacting with our audience the same way that we're interacting with our documentary subjects class fun in your first weaving. And basically it's a relationship of trust. And it helps keep the peace we've found so far. But you don't always get it right. Um, as you probably know, especially if you have any children, um, the internet isn't a very nice place. People will say things on the internet that they'll never say to you in person. People can be extremely nasty. Um, and we've, of course, like anyone else, we get a lot of negative comments. Like, your subtitles suck and you guys should make another expedition to find the damn thing. Lovely, thank you for your support. <laughs> and that was probably one of the nicer ones. Um, we, didn't, um, we have a very balanced amount of comments, but um, we have to think, too, how do we react to this? Do we say, no, our subtitles are fine, we had a professional subtitle person do it, we checked it, we speak you know, English fluently, you don't know what you're talking about, you suck. Um, or do we just leave it? And what we found um, by doing research to see uh, how other people do, this is particularly common for independent documentaries, because we've become so attached to this project and people have no idea how much time you spent on it and all these sort of things, and if someone says something bad about it, you go, no, it's for this reason, react. And so we saw what happened in this situation, and it goes bad really quick. So right from the start we said, we're not replying to these comments. Uh, but what we found is that audience will then do that for us. And so we're out of the fight, <laughs> and we can just sit back and get some popcorn. Um, of course we get nice comments as well. That wasn't it, uh, just so you know, they're not insinuating that we're um, <laughs> from, the, this was just to show that there was one theory that the ghost rockets might have been from, uh, from the Soviets or for, from the Soviet Germans testing Soviet technology. But um, yeah, I'll leave it. Um, this opportunity, having access to the whole world through internet, is really good and nice, uh, but it also comes with a bit of problems. Uh, it also means that we are now competing with everyone else in the world for attention. So how do we reach out? What do we do? Um, we spent about a year working on Facebook, trying to connect with different UFO blogs, um, many different strategies, Facebook ads, etc. And what we did one week before the expedition, we put this doodle up on the first uh, page of Pirate Bay, 
because we felt that geeks hang out to Pirate Bay and we think that they're our audience. So we talked to Pirate Bay and they're like, yes, we like your project, put, we can put this up for you. So we put this up one week before and when you clicked on it, it took people to our Facebook page where they could watch the trailer for the documentary and hang out in the Facebook group and follow the investigation. One week before uh, we went off to the expedition, we had 1,079 likes and that took us a year to get that. We struggled really hard to get 1,079 likes. It was actually harder than we thought when we began. And one week, just when we came back from the expedition, we had 8,554. And we know, because we've checked out, that like 7,000 of these came directly from the Pirate Bay website. Um, so our advice is quite obvious, but team up with someone. Team up with someone that has access to the audience or the people that you're interested in. For us, this is how it worked really well for us. And uh, when we were sitting at the lake in there in the forest and you for Sweden were out diving and we were checking Facebook on our cell phone, we were like, oh, a hundred more, a hundred more. Uh, it was very, very exciting. And it turned out that people from all over the world followed our expedition. We had people, I hope you find what you're seeking from USA Kentucky, good luck from Brazil. Here's someone from Spain, Chile, uh, Argentina, America, New Zealand. Um, and for us, this was the, the reward. This was re realizing that we had, at least for now, succeeded with what we wanted. We wanted people to know about the expedition. We wanted people to be excited about if you first read and found something or not. So, um, what would f the last two years have been really uh, interesting? Um, but, like I said, we've had to learn how to do many things that we didn't anticipate. But what we've found is that um, being part of something that's uh, new and, and is, has a lot of energy in it, and there's a lot of buzz right now around transmedia, the whole industry is like, transmedia, if there's any type of seminar, everyone runs off to the seminar, and everyone's talking about it, and, and maybe my project should be transmedia as well, and, and there's just so much buzz around it. And what's really interesting about it is that everyone else is in the same boat we are. There are no experts that we can call. Uh, there's nobody that even knows. And even there are a few people that sort of get paid to talk. When you really speak to them, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> and there's something about this atmosphere which I find really, really rewarding working in. Um, it would have been much easier for us to just make a film will probably be close to being done right now. My hair wouldn't be turning grey. Uh, <laughs> would have social life, friends, all these things. Um, but it's, it's just been so fun to be part of something that's new. There's just this energy. And I know that I will never regret having a stab at it. So I think that we're done to get today. Oh, well, good. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure to be here.